So we're obviously here to mainly talk about cryptocurrency and blockchain. And there's lots of buzzwords in the industry, but those are the two main areas that we're going to talk about today. But I'm obviously going to come at it from a financial kind of background. So I apologize now, but I think it's important just to take it all in context. So a little bit about, about my story, if you like. Um, a client of mine mentioned Bitcoin about three years ago, and I completely dismissed them, said, no, you don't want to touch that. Uh, I think I probably mentioned drugs. Um, I probably mentioned dark web and just said, leave it alone. Um, if only I knew what I knew now. Um, that was three years ago. Um, and the same thing happened again two years ago. Another client said, have you heard of Bitcoin, John? I went, oh, no, I'm not sure. It's not regulated, so I can't talk to you about it. Um, so I'm not really sure. And I just dismissed it. And the reason why the YouTube and the Netflix logo is there is because it felt like Bitcoin was following me around when I was online or watching Netflix or even on a, on a plane. Um, there was a documentary or someone was talking about Bitcoin or there was some mention of Bitcoin, um, even an advert in the screen from like someone like eToro or something like that. And it just kind of felt like it was following me around. Um, so kind of middle of last year, uh, my sister also mentioned Bitcoin. She's a bit more intelligent than me. She's a vet. So she, had, she went to university and um, she was saying, you know, what about this Bitcoin thing? And so I started to think, well, I need to just do some research, you know, do some, look into it more and understand it more and not, not just dismiss it without understanding the facts. Like you would do with any investment, okay, with any product. Um, so I started looking into it, um, started going onto Twitter, onto YouTube, um, and I've got some faces on the screen there. Um, some of you might know um, Philip Nunn here in the corner. And I managed to, I, I decided that, I'm kind of jumping forward a little bit, but I went to a conference in February of this year, and it kind of, I'd already gone into crypto, but it kind of really enforced the decision I'd actually reached uh, by meeting some of these guys. And the guy over here, Gavin Brown, he's an economist at the uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, he's, off, he's an, a, a qualified accountant. And then there's a, a guy over here called Vlad uh, from Bristol. He's a techie and, and he runs a software company in Bristol. And Charles Radcliffe, uh, who I was meeting the other day, um, he, he used to work in banking. Uh, and Osborne Clark is an international legal firm, which I started to talk to. But just slightly going back a bit to the um, middle of last year, I, I really decided I just needed to read and listen and research because too many people are jumping into crypto without understanding the facts. Um, I'm not saying you should be indecisive, but I do think you should uh, just step back, have a listen, have a read, research, uh, and as I've said, and do that again and repeat it. Uh, and these are some of the places where I started um, on, on YouTube. Um, some books, a, a little mention to Crypto Pulse, because we've got two guys in the room, we're going to be speaking to you afterwards um, who've been really helpful especially more recently we're just putting some great content together and uh, you know helping with my education and again I mentioned Twitter I started a originally I started a WhatsApp group for friends and family and then people said to me why don't you just start you know do it you know go on to, to, to uh, Twitter so we had a WhatsApp group and I actually was called uh, on Twitter at the beginning I was called Crypto John um, and I decided that, no, why am I hiding? You know, why am I hiding my real name, if you like? Um, so I came out, if you like, and actually became, maybe that's not the right phrase, but you know what I mean. Um, so I came out as uh, John Boatman underscore UK. So, and I just feel that was important for me. Just initially, it was, I wasn't really sure how I was going to take this and uh, the route I was going to take from a, maybe from a collaboration and business point of view. So I'm really, what I'm saying here is, Please do research, you know, do some research, read some stuff, uh, listen to people. You, when you listen to people, or you, even when you look at uh, what they've liked on Twitter, you get a feel for a person. Uh, there's so much content out there. There is content in the UK. There is a lot, obviously, in the US, which most of these, um, these YouTube channels are from the US. Um, and some of these people are trading as well, which I haven't got time for. Um, but there is some really good content out there, and, um, you know, it's, it's important you, you get that uh, information. And this is really just backed up by some statistics here. Um, 
one in, one in 20 Brits, 3 million people, um, have actually invested without actually fully understanding what they're investing in. Um, so I think you know, that just reiterates what I'm saying. So again, repeating what I've said. Listen, read, research, learn, repeat, just like you would do with, for any other financial decision you make. When a client comes to me and wants to look at investing money, whether that be in pensions or investments, which are regulated investments, they want to understand the options. They want to understand the choices. So just like you would do with any financial decision you make, whether you buy a new car, you know, a house, PC that works, et cetera, et cetera. And bank account, which will become a little bit more uh, obvious why I've put that there. So the history of money. Um, I started to kind of look back into history because even though I'm, you know, during the, you know, my, my normal trade is a, as a financial advisor, an independent financial advisor. I don't work for a bank, so don't beat me up. Um, but I, I've, I've always been an independent financial advice. But I didn't really understand the history of money. So I started to come across this more with some of the educators, as I call them, who I'd been watching and, and listening to, um, and started to kind of go back into history and realize that, you know, money as we know it um, is, is relatively new. Um, I think, um, you know, we... You know, you, you, we used to trade with grain or corn or cattle or whatever it might be. Um, and the reason for gold being there is not that long ago um, in history, people used to trade with gold, pieces of gold. Do you know many people walking around with bags of gold? Uh, I have actually got one client who's got some gold pieces. But there's not many people walking around the street with bags of gold anymore. Um, but that's what used to happen, and it wasn't that long ago. Um, and then suddenly the governments decided, oh no, we, it was actually around about World War I actually, that the gold standard as it was called, uh, and the world wars uh, actually meant that uh, when the US got involved, there was a change. And if you read the book I mentioned before, the Bitcoin uh, standard book, it talks about the history of, of that, those decisions that were made around the gold standard as it was called, and how we moved towards what's called fiat. Um, so... Again, being in financial services, you might think, well, he probably knew what fiat currency was. I didn't have a clue what fiat currency was. I'd never heard the word. Uh, I thought it was a car. I'll be honest, you know, it is a car, isn't it? So, uh, started, you know, when you start to learn about these things, you actually start to sit back and just, you know, take note of what's going on. Fiat money is, as it says there, a currency that a government has declared is the legal tender. This is what we will use. Um, and someone, someone did this to me last year. They put two notes in front of me. So this is a five and ten pound note. Now, what is it? It's just paper. It's just paper, isn't it? But what makes that worth ten pounds and that worth five pounds? It's because the governments or the people, us, have granted it value. The people have granted it value, not anything else. It's just a piece of paper. It could be a piece of metal, but if you say that that's worth five pounds and it's a piece of metal, then it's worth five pounds worth of metal. But it's just an illusion that the people have granted. And someone said that to me last year, and I just thought, well, no, it's, it's, it's what we use. It's what we, we've been so used to it, but it's not been that long that it wasn't like that. It used to be gold pieces. And as you might have seen recently, a tweet that Fiat, the car company, did actually send out. It was actually, I think, this week, uh, or last week, um, they're kind of confused while they're getting all this uh, hashtag fiat currency. So I do some talks in schools and we talk about money. Uh, what is money? So I'm bringing some of that to this presentation because, you know, even in financial services, I didn't really sit and study what money is. We're now used to using some of these devices. I had a cup of coffee with Charles Radcliffe, who was on the screen earlier the other day. And it was in the engine, hub, uh, engine shed in Bristol, which is um, nearer to my, where I c come from. And he just went up and pressed his wearable device, his Apple Watch, and paid for the coffee. So, you know, people are using contactless um, all the time. And would you believe it was introduced 10 years ago? You know, how many people, you know, are spending their money? They're not actually spending their money. They're maybe using contactless uh, or obviously Apple Pay. Apple Pay is huge. It'd be nice to have an Apple coin. 
Um, and these are just some statistics that came out at the end of last year. 75% um, of people in this country uh, are using contactless. Um, and that's doubled in the last 12 months. Um, and again, 75% uh, use online banking. I've got people I know in their 80s are using online banking. Okay. Uh, and re something that happened at the end of last year in the UK is the switch where there was more transactions done by debit cards um, than there were with cash. And that's the first time that's happened. Okay, a few more statistics. I'm in financial services, so statistics, sorry. Um, so again, it's something that you, when you look into it, uh, I've put millennials on the screen there because I think uh, this technology is attracting a lot of the younger generation. I'm 50 years old, I am attracted to it, but there's a lot of data that suggests that cryptocurrency is very popular within the younger generation, the millennials. Um, so just a few statistics there. And what um, I found uh, amazing was that actually, if you look at the last statistic there, hardly any of these individuals, these young, the younger generation, visit a bank branch. Uh, and I've actually been in my local town, which is Chippenham, down in Wiltshire. And I've, I've been in, in Chippenham at quarter to nine in the morning. And there are people queuing outside NatWest Bank. And there are people inside the bank walking around, making sure it's all nice and tidy. And they're all standing there waiting for the bank to open. Well, why don't you just open the bank? Let the people in. And obviously, po most of the people in the queue are probably over 65. No disrespect to my mum. But, you know, it doesn't make any sense. So the millennials, the younger generation, the people in the room, people watching online, um, I think you're, the reason you're maybe involved in crypto or you're interested in cryptocurrency um, because you're interested in tech. You know, I was interested in finance and tech. So this has brought me to here. And I think as well, if you talk to people in schools, uh, and this is statistics slightly older than the, the school population, but young adults, 24-year-olds, you know, the under 24, 60% of them would prefer to have everything on their phone or an app. They'd work their bills, their payments, etc. So I'm kind of leading you from the banking and the way we had been operating in the past um, to show you what's happening with technology. So here is um, something that's happened in the UK predominantly um, with technology as it's advanced and innovation. We have lots of blank bank closures, but we also have some newer uh, banking alternatives, shall we say. I don't know if anyone in the room is using any of the ones on the right. I think Ben has told me he's using Monzo before. I, I actually am using the top bottom two. I've used the bottom two really good. And I've missed one out because Diddy, who's speaking later, has already mentioned Wirex, which is a, it's not really a bank, is it? It's more of a, a debit card system which uses crypto. So there's lots of alternatives and the, the speed of change is, 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 is crazy. Um, so how do we get to this position? How do we get to um, the increase of the knowledge of cryptocurrency? Well, we had a crisis back in 2007, 8 and I remember it quite well because I sat in front of clients who'd lost money. It's not a nice meeting to have. Um, and we all maybe know about why it happened, um, and I won't go into that, and I won't get all political about it, but the point I'm making is it happened. It was one of the worst crises since the 1930s, and the Lehman, Lehman Brothers went bust, and this is uh, the S&P 500 is the stock market in America, and this is what kind of happened in the lead-up, and you might remember it started with mortgage, you know, mortgage debt that was packaged up, um, and sold on and on and on, and, it, and everything just crashed. So we had a, a massive crisis, and um, people lived through that crisis. Um, and so what the banks do, uh, the, the banks uh, around the world decide they'll print more money. And this is part of the bigger problem that we have right now. The financial system in the UK and around the world is broken, um, and we have banks around the world that have continued to print money. They just continue, just print, print, print. I think it's something like $164 trillion worth of global debt. Global debt. It's more, you'll see in a minute, you'll, um, it's more than we have actually got money. You know, there's not enough money to cover the debt. Um, if you don't know what SNB is, it's the Swiss National Bank. 
Um, so you've got the, the Fed, obviously, in America at the bottom. Uh, ECB is the European Central Bank, Bank of England, um, et cetera, Japan and China. And we've lived through a time where interest rates have also gone. I mean, I don't know about you. I bought my first property in the 80s. I'm a bit older. And interest rates were 15%. And when I've done this talk in schools, they've said, oh, were interest rates really 6%? And I'm like, well, they were, but they were 15% back in the 80s. So we've been through periods of higher interest rates. And you're also in a situation now where, I mean, you've seen maybe recently interest rates increase. That, that is the Bank of England base rate. Um, if you can get 1% or 2% in the bank with your money, tell me about it, because there aren't that many banks paying very good interest. So at the moment, people are losing money. They've got their money in the bank. Interest rates are very low, but inflation is increasing. So in real terms, they're losing money. And the general population, when talking about money, don't understand what's happening. They don't understand that. They don't understand that their inflation is eating into their money and not getting the same uh, returns that they need. OK, so one of the reasons we're in the room or on, um, online at the moment is because we're here because of something called Bitcoin. Um, that was created back in 2008 by a person or a group. It could have been a lady, which my wife points out. Um, it could have been a lady. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto. And he came up with what maybe is a solution. Um, and you'll see here I've covered a couple of things here about the, the kind of the two challenges that Bitcoin looked to, to solve. Uh, the Trust in the trustless system. So normally when you're trading money from one to the other, there is a counterparty or a centralized party like a bank, uh, whether that or it might be PayPal. Um, so there's a centralized organization. So we were, looking, we were looking to solve that problem and the double spend problem. How do I know that if I send money to you, you're going to send me the goods back? So all the, all the money, whatever it might be. Uh, some of you might know there are t a total of 21 million Bitcoin. There are about 17 million in circulation at the moment. Um, some of those have probably been lost. Some people have died without telling their relatives they had Bitcoin. There was a guy, and I think he was in the Bristol area, uh, Kevin and Ben might back me up on this, where he lost a, a hard drive, and he was actually, he remembered he'd lost the, he recycled or sent the hard drive off for recycling or put it in the bin. Am I right? And he... Uh, he was a Welsh guy, or was in Welsh, was it Welsh? Um, and he was actually, he went to the landfill site looking for his hard drive, which he reckoned, I think it was about seven million pounds at the time. He's still looking. He's still looking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would as well if it was seven million pounds or seven million dollars. So he threw away a hard drive. So there are lots, lots of Bitcoin that is not actually ever going to be in circulation. It's been lost um, or it's been stolen. Um, but there are only 21 million. So there's no organization that's going to print more money. As I said before, there's only 21 million. So a cryptocurrency is deflationary. OK, important point to remember. Now, I don't know what it's worth today, right now, uh, but when I put this presentation together, I know we've had, we've had an interesting week, shall we say. I went, when I went to the conference in February, uh, we had an interesting week that day, too, when we were actually in the middle of the conference, and one of the speakers actually had their Coinbase app and showed the Coinbase app amount at the beginning of the presentation and at the end of the presentation, and it had gone down by about £2,000. And he, he, was, you know, he, was, he was prepared to, sh to show the numbers. So I don't know what the value of Bitcoin is today. I think it's, it's definitely below $7,000. But you know, if when I put this presentation together at the beginning of the week, it was $7,000. But what's important, and I, and I didn't realize this at the beginning, is you don't, you, you don't have to buy one Bitcoin. You can buy a proportion of it. You can buy a fractional amount of Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency like Bitcoin Private. So I talked about um, trust in the trustless system, uh, the double spend problem, something that was um, solved, in my opinion, by the, the white paper on Bitcoin that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto issued in 2008. All right, so to have a, a cryptocurrency or digital currency, um, you need to have a, a system that doesn't need a centralized counterparty. And I believe that cryptocurrency actually uh, presents that solution, okay, with the use of blockchain. Um, bit of fun. You might have heard this story. Um, 
Guy in America in 2010, which by, in 2010 Bitcoin was a, you know, was a penny, um, and he bought two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin. Now, it comes up and it goes a bit viral around about May of every year. If you go online in May of every year, you normally find something mentioned about this transaction. But we are going to have to get a stage, to a stage where we're not accumulating our tokens on our crypto, but we're actually spending our tokens. And this was the first person to actually transact and spend his crypto. And if you look at the numbers, you'll work out that those, those two pizzas were about, depending on what number you use, between $60 million and $200 million, depending on the range you want to look at from the beginning of this year to, to, the, to the last week. And I think what I'm getting across here is that we are in the very early stages of adoption and innovation is still happening. There are, about, there are over 1,500 cryptocurrencies. Are they cryptocurrencies? Are they tokens? Are they assets? Are they utility tokens? There are, you have to be careful when you say cryptocurrencies. Um, but what I want to get across is that, you know, do not invest in this technology um, to make money, all right? Because right now, you're not going to do that. You might do that for a short period of time, but I, I've learned that I don't think that is the, the advice or the tips or the guidance should be, that should be given. You should be buying the technology. You should be buying the innovation. You should be buying for the future. And um, if you look at the history of what's been happening, you'll realize that there have been some great periods, but there also have been some retrace or negative periods. Okay? So these are just some examples. So if you bought cryptocurrency at the beginning of this year, one, you might not be in the room, all right? Because you may not ever rec uh, invest in cryptocurrencies again. Um, but if you are still in the room, then you probably bought the technology rather than to make money quickly, get rich quick, okay? There have been negatives and there have been positives. It's not a get rich quick. Buy the technology, learn about the technology, learn about what's going on, okay? This is the last 12 months, up to the beginning of this week. So if you'd invested a year ago, people forget, a year ago, Bitcoin was worth about $3,200 approximately. And it's easily forgotten. But in, in traditional investments, if you make 10% in 12 months, you're normally happy. You have to ex understand we're going through an early adoption stage and we haven't, we're not, we haven't got there. And someone said to me, if you buy cryptocurrency, someone said this to me last year, if you bought Bitcoin or you bought Litecoin or um, Bitcoin private, whatever cryptocurrency you bought, and you say, say you had 100 of them, you've still got 100 of them today. Forget about the, the value of the in pounds or fiat currency, you've still got 100 of the token that you bought. Okay? It doesn't, it's not nice to look at the value, Okay, but I was looking at the value every day, probably five times a day. I don't do that now. Okay, I just think I've bought the tokens, I've bought the technology, I've bought the, the projects that I like, um, and I've decided to hold them. I've still got them, whether the value's gone down or not. I've still got the tokens. You've still got 100 Bitcoin private. It doesn't matter what the value is at the moment. Are you going to sell them? Are you going to use them? Probably right now, not. Matt might kick me for this because we're obviously going to, he's going to tell us about the wallet. So the last 12 months have been really good for Bitcoin, but the last seven months or so haven't been so good for Bitcoin. Does it matter? It doesn't matter. Okay. But this is all about this emotional roller coaster. And this is not just to do with cryptocurrency. This is to do with any investment that has volatility, has risk. Um, you know, are you a high-risk investor? You probably are a high-risk investor if you invest in cryptocurrency. You wouldn't put all your money in crypto. Maybe you would, and we all hear that presentation later, okay? But as a, as a you know, it, it's your decision. You will, make, you will do your research, and you will decide for yourself and your family what is the right decision for, for you, okay? Emotions, okay? The, I've, I've put this on Twitter quite a few times, just not when, it's all, not when it's always going down, when things are going up as well. You know, we, it's all very well to invest when things are going up. In December, everyone's getting in, oh, I'm going to miss out. You've heard the saying, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out. So you, everyone's jumping on the train. 
Okay, but how many of the people stayed on the train? Because as it started to come down, uh, my sister's still on the train, but she and I have had different opinion on this. She was looking for a quick fix, a quick, a quick return, but she started to realize that this is not what it's about. So it's the emotions. People don't normally buy when it's down the bottom. Some institutions do. Talk about institutions later. I'm just going to go through a few slides quickly because of time. Um, this just shows the dominance of Bitcoin. This number has actually increased. This, I think it was, I saw it online this morning. It's now 50%. So Bitcoin's dominance, as you can, as you can see, has decreased when other uh, tokens became available. And recently, as kind of like the store of value, if you like, the digital gold, sometimes referred to, there are lots of traders that trade crypto, but they end up back in Bitcoin as their kind of store of value. And that started to increase recently with the volatility. So last year, somebody showed me this. And I think it's really important to, to remember, just think before you buy. Before you press the button to buy, just think about some of these things. As I've said already, do your own research. Don't go to a financial advisor because he can't give you advice because it's not regulated. Don't go down the pub because do your own research. Do some research. Please read some books. Listen to podcasts. Crypto Pulse. Okay? Um, people then, when they've done the research, what then happens is, oh, I'm not sure, and they're ind indecisive. You know, you've got to back yourself. You've, you, you've done your research, you go with it. All right? They also don't invest enough. Now, I was one of those people, I'll be honest. Last year, middle of last year, I invested some money. But I now, from what I now know, I would have invested more money. My wife's in the corner, so I have to be careful. Um, don't use a credit card. Don't take out a loan. That happened a lot. You might have seen at the end of last year, banks stopping credit card usage. Selling without making a profit or after making a small profit. Why would you sell if the market, if you've lost 50%, why would you sell? You just, you've, you've got the tokens, you've bought the investment, you've bought the technology. Uh, you're not trying to get rich quick. You just want to actually, you've bought the technology. So why would you sell? Uh, sell after a dip, which is what I'm saying. Thinking too short term. Uh, and obviously, really important, don't invest what you can't afford to lose. It's, it's like going to a casino. When you walk into a casino, we all want to win. I went to Vegas last year for my 50th. Of course I wanted to win, um, but you have to accept that you might lose. And if you have that attitude, it's a lot easier to deal with. And in the context of the global market we are in, this is a little bit out of date, this is the beginning of this year, Cryptocurrencies are tiny. There's, there's nothing, okay? And you may know the numbers are out of date. You've seen, I mean, Apple recently, a trillion-dollar organization, and uh, the, the cryptocurrency market has obviously dipped. But we're, we're so small in comparison to the stock market and physical money, all right? Just bear that in mind, and remember the number that's not on the screen. I was going to have a big flash of red. $164 trillion of global debt. 164 trillion. Do you see that number anywhere on the screen? No, because it's a lot of money and it's, too, it's, it's, it's crazy. So in some ways, is cryptocurrency the pin that's going to burst the bubble of the financial system that's already there, rather than what people have said, that Bitcoin's the bubble? Well, we've had loads of bubbles in Bitcoin. We've had retraces, we've had negative. But the global system of debt, that's actually the bubble. That's the problem. I found this interesting. I saw this online. Some of you might have seen this. Just to remember, when you're talking to people in schools, especially, it makes you realize these things happen so quickly. You know, Snapchat has gone and, you know, here. Maybe they've had some problems recently. Share price has gone down. The younger generation don't like it, so they jump and do something else. So in 2006, the iPhone wasn't around. The iPad wasn't around. It's mad. It's only 12 years ago. Only 12 years ago. Bitcoin obviously wasn't around. Blockchain wasn't around. I'm going to race through these ones. Just about earlier, you know, just adoption. Okay. So obviously the orange line you can see in the middle is the plane. So it eventually took off. And as you get to the right, you'll see that they're going quicker up because the adoption of technology is much quicker with the speed of the internet and things like that. So you've got the mobile phone. You've got things like the PlayStation, the kind of uh, SLR kind of cameras. And at the right at the end, you've got Bitcoin. Just quickly touch on this. 
uh, there's something like two billion people around the world who haven't got a bank account or haven't got access to a financial institution. If you can't see the numbers, particularly because I'm in the way, the, the darker number means they haven't got a bank account or they can't access a financial institution. You, you might have seen this online a lot because it's not just about the UK. Cryptocurrency is global and it could help a lot of people. It could make a lot of difference. Just moving a little bit onto regulation or, or you know, what is, what is cryptocurrency? So there is argument around the world, what is cryptocurrency? Is it money or currency? Is it a commodity? Is it a security utility token or something else? Uh, in 2014, the Her Majesty's um, Revenue and Customs, you know, quite a few years ago, made a comment. They've recently formed a, a, the Global Financial Innovation Network. They are trying to understand globally um, what cryptocurrency is and where it fits. Different countries class it as money, some countries class it as commodities, etc. Uh, my accountant, I spoke to my accountant a couple of weeks ago about cryptocurrency. She's really interested. She wouldn't let me pay her in cryptocurrency yet. Um, but uh, she, she said, well, how can you regulate it? It's global. And what was gold? Gold was global, wasn't it? Gold was our global currency. Why couldn't we have a digital global currency? Um, recently, we've had a lot of talk about institutions. Do we actually want institutions back? Did they not mess it up in the first place? But we might need some institutional money to come into the space. And there's been talk of a, an ETF, an exchange traded fund. Uh, I won't bore you with the details. I'll talk to you afterwards if you wish. But you can track most, thing, most things. You can buy a, an ETF in most things. Okay? And I thought the interesting point, this is quite recent, this survey at the bottom here, uh, Reuters. Do you not think the financial institutions are looking at buying cryptocurrency or buying technology businesses? They are. And, and actually, it's been proven that some institutions say one thing one day, and behind the scenes, they are actually doing the opposite. That's actually been proven. Going back to gold again. Um, my wife prefers, prefers silver, to be honest with you. Um, but gold. So I talked earlier about, do you know anyone who owns gold? Uh, and many investors buy gold through ETFs. And this is just showing what happened when the gold ETF, the first gold ETF was launched in 2004. And what happened after that happened? Will there be a, a crypto Bitcoin um, ETF? What will happen when it's launched? Will it be launched? There's quite a few commentators that think it could be launched by the end of this year, maybe next year. But are we, are we actually seeing the birth of a new asset class? Okay. Why wouldn't you maybe invest a little bit of your wealth in this new asset class? But until it's, until it's properly regulated, and some people will argue they don't want regulation or they want light regulation, um, until a granny's lost £100,000 on Bitcoin, the regulators are not going to come in and be too heavy-handed, I don't think. We'll see what happens. I won't go into too much detail. I'm not a, a techie, but I needed to understand what blockchain was. And when I did understand what blockchain was, I realized that many, many industries and many businesses, and that's, and really for me, that has become much more interesting than the crypto side. Crypto side's done. I've done the research. I've bought some tokens. I've accumulating them, set aside some money for that. But the actual blockchain technology is, to me, fascinating. And obviously, it's the technology that originates from Bitcoin. So I won't go into great detail because of time, um, but it fixes the double spend problem and it's highly efficient. So why wouldn't businesses look at it? And many businesses are looking at it. And when I started to research, I talked to accountants, solicitors, IT specialists, um, and a lot of the big, the, the big companies in those areas have got departments that look after blockchain, advise companies on blockchain or distribution ledger technology. Okay. I've seen, I've seen great examples in education, finance, food, legal, property. And I've put a common theme at the bottom, supply chain, if you can see that. Music, you know, you might have heard of automotive system or automotive, so cars that are going to have digital wallets in them. Um, there are many, I mean, crowdfunding, there's, all, there's loads of industries already looking. Logistics is huge as well. 
So there's loads of uh, industry that is using blockchain, okay? And just repeating that, really, there's departments within big organizations that have do it yourself. Go on to PwC, big accountancy firm in the UK. Go on to the website, Osborne Clark, I've got to know them quite well. They're international, but they had an office in Bristol and London, and I was talking to the London office. They came down to our recent seminar that we, that we had in, in Bristol. They, they're advising companies on the legal side of, of blockchain. Um, look, look, understand smart contracts, understand what that's about, if you don't already. Um, a recent report about the money that's being invested in um, blockchain. Uh, IT companies, uh, software, Intel, they've all got departments or services available for blockchain. It's huge business already. Some commercial examples. Uh, in our Bristol uh, seminar, we had a guy who, who I mentioned earlier, Vlad. Um, he was demonstrating a food protocol on blockchain where they looked at the problem that they had with the E. coli disease. I think it was 2011 when the E. coli disease hit. And they couldn't find the source of the problem. It took them three months. This is without the technology. It took them three months to source the farm where the cucumbers came from, which had caused the problem. Meanwhile, I think about 30 people died. Um, and they're putting together a food protocol, which they demonstrated in Bristol in our seminar, uh, where it takes, I think it's seven minutes to find, as long as the data is there, with blockchain, it will, and that, that uh, chart over on the right-hand side there, that was from his presentation. So it's, it's all about the data and how you work the data, but that's being done on blockchain. Um, I think you, some of you may have seen the Richard Branson tweet recently, uh, tweeting about blockchain, the project he's involved in. It's the, all, all of these are to do with supply chain and food, okay, IBM. And my last slide before the answer to my question, which you may have forgotten by now about the builders, is tokenization. So I think this is huge and we're not really talking about it in a big way, but the institutions are talking about it. And there are projects that are looking to tokenize companies, all right, especially, especially newer companies, new startups. So why wouldn't you issue a digital token rather than a share? So you, you know, you, buy a share in Apple or Next or Marks, not, not Marks and Spencers, that's not a good example today. They've shut seven stores. Um, but you, why wouldn't you have a digital token? And if you think about it on a platform, you think about it on a blockchain, just go through that in your own mind. You know, it's, it's a way of tokenizing a company. And why can't I pass a share of a company to someone in the audience from my phone? Why do I need to go through a third party to do that and pay the fees? and so on. Am I doing myself out of a job? Am I future-proofing my business, maybe? That's another way of looking at it. So blockchain can help in this area. And this is, this is too big a subject to put it on one slide. Um, you could probably do that in one afternoon. That, that, to me, is huge. So my message really is, I got in crypto because I wanted to make some money quickly. But I wasn't going to probably sell the crypto, so why was I thinking that? But then as I started to learn about cryptocurrency, but more importantly, the technology behind it, I realized that this technology is going to change the world. And why, going, why wouldn't we have a, um, a global currency? We started this podcast at the start of this year, and it was really born out of the frustration that there really wasn't much good information out there, especially in the UK, about cryptocurrencies uh, and Bitcoin. So we have kind of skyrocketed, and thankfully, unlike mm. the crypto market, haven't fallen <laughs> off yet. So uh, we, we're actually, although we're the UK's number one, we're downloaded in over 140 different countries, which yep. includes all kinds of exotic places, in, like French Polynesia is one of the really weird examples, actually, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, if yeah. you can even say the word. Um, and we get about 500 listens every day, which is really cool because we'd never done a podcast before. And we really started it because we wanted to learn. We wanted to learn from uh, individuals all across the globe about what crypto was, how blockchain is going to change the industry. And through that process, Ben and I have really learned a lot ourselves. And we've built a, uh, a fantastic uh, community of listeners. So to any of those watching now on the live feed, thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, for any of them listening on today's show, we really appreciate um, all the support that 
that you've given us. So we're published on all major podcasting platforms, which includes things like iTunes, Stitcher, um, Pocket Cast. We actually have our own website, which is cryptopulse.co.uk, where you can listen to. We get a lot of listens through the website. And it just gets shared all across the internet. So it's something that's been uh, really exciting. But our crucial tagline is that we empower our listeners to make informed decisions. So we don't ever give advice. What we do is talk about some of the things that we've done, some of the things that we've learned, including some of the bad mistakes we've made. We're very happy to share those. There's been a few. There's been quite (laughs) a few. But it's been more good ones, just, I think. So um, these are uh, some of the guests that we've had on the show. We've had uh, people like Philip Nunn, who's one of the uh, UK's top uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain influencers. He's an ICO advisor. He's worked on loads of different projects. So he's actually become a friend of the show because he's been on on twice, which is is really great. Um, And it's been fascinating to reach out to all of these experts in their own different fields because... Uh, we can, it's not having a hotline to anyone in this sector and saying, hey, can we ask you a load of questions for 30 minutes? And because we're, we're curious. We've also got um, projects like Digibyte and, of course, Bitcoin Private. Uh, we had, had Jake Bruckman on, which was a really awesome episode. And we, uh, because Bitcoin Private came on our radar because of, of Philip Nunn, actually, he was talking to me about it one day. And that's really what's brought us here. So we've created this amazing network of listeners and mentors for us as well. Um, and we've had Richard Burton, who worked with Vitalik Buterin at, uh, at the Ethereum project and has also launched Balance Wallet. And um, Sarah Simeone, I think I'm saying her last name right, John? So, so Sarah's amazing. In fact, I asked her how to pronounce her last name and she said, you decide. So she's and Italian. We did. And we did. Uh, <laughs> and I thought Simeone sounded sounded quite quite good so yeah, um, she was a genius actually. she's amazing so if you haven't checked us out please do has anyone here actually listened to our show before yeah a few people okay. yeah okay awesome all right fantastic so if anyone that has it's listened before photo. oh they're amazing photos sultry yeah <laughs> um for anyone that has listened to our show before they know that we always ask our guests one question at the start does anyone know what that is Okay. Okay, yeah. so it's a really good chance for us to introduce ourselves to you in a little bit more detail. So, Ben, I'll let you kick off because I've stolen the limelight again. Well, uh, tell us how your blockchain journey began. Mine was quite a, a simple one, really. I, uh, I was reading a Reddit article back in 2012 uh, that was just kind of talking a little bit about Bitcoin and some of the technology behind it. Uh, And Bitcoin actually was kind of in its early phases and there weren't really a lot of places that you could buy it. But uh, with some research, I found an exchange online and spent the last... What year was this though? I think this was late late 2012, early 2013. Very early. So it was was quite early. So you can see Um, I hate him already because he bought Bitcoin in 2013. Yeah, I mean, it was a punt because I don't think there was was a lot of information. There certainly wasn't a a lot of people, you know, talking about it. No, no. Uh, and in fact, I think the market cap for Bitcoin was, was under 10, 20 million at the time. So it was, it, right, it wow. was low. Okay. Uh, so I, I used the last of the money that I had at the time. I was 23. I didn't have a lot. Uh, and, and I bought some Bitcoin. Uh, and I won't say how much, but I, you know, I, I got in early. Uh, and then actually forgot that I had them. Uh, because, you know, life takes over, and I think it was last you, year. You didn't lose them, though, thankfully. No, I didn't, I didn't lose them, thankfully. But then last year, uh, we were heading out to uh, Croatia, funnily enough, and I was queuing up at the airport, and I was reading a BBC article uh, talking about the price of Bitcoin and how Bitcoin had skyrocketed and it, it beat all the analysts, and it, it, it was doing great things. And I thought, well, that's amazing. I totally forgot that I had it. And, <laughs> uh, and, that, and that was it. It kind of reignited my passion for uh, Bitcoin specifically, but also blockchain technology. And, uh, and I think that was, that, that was kind of the, the real start for me was, was back last year. Cool. Awesome. And we'll throw it back at you, actually. I mean, what, yeah, you, how did your, my journey begin? Yours is relatively short. Well, mine short. didn't begin in 2013. Yeah. Uh, it actually began very early last year. So I still class myself as a crypto veteran. But you we, know, that's we what, do say, I yeah, mean, one, one you're year... You're definitely in, a veteran. You're, you're 
probably the biggest veteran yeah. now, I think, apart we, from Satoshi himself. Well, yeah, I mean, we were pals. We hung out in the day. But we, <laughs> say, we say that uh, a year in cryptocurrency, I mean, it's like dog years, it right? Is. A year it's in dog years what? Is... I mean, someone probably knows this. That's seven or ten years. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, it's, so, it's, so it's you are you are how... How long have you been in it based on Practically that, dead now, I yeah. would say. <laughs> right, okay. Well, before you do, Dyer, yes. please, please make sure that you uh, yeah, have your keys. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll give you the private keys. Oh, They're thank all you. yours. So, uh, yeah, my blockchain journey began really like most people's, I think. I, I, cryptocurrency was on my radar early last year. It was actually part of, um, I, it came on my radar through a mentorship group that I'm in, an entrepreneur mentorship group called Shank Minds, which is run by a chap called Peter Shankman, who's written a bunch of books, he's a public speaker, he's a, uh, quite a well-known guy in the States, he's based in New York, and I've met him a few times, I'm part of this group, and he was saying, oh, I bought some Litecoin today, and I thought, oh, okay, what's Litecoin? And I, I opened a Coinbase account, I'd heard of Bitcoin and didn't really know what it was, and a few of the guys are on there saying, look, it's kind of like Bitcoin, but it's slightly different. And we think it's the silver if Bitcoin's the gold. And I put a relatively small amount for me in. Uh, I won't say how much, but it was nothing more than I could afford to lose. And this was the crucial thing. I tried it. I tested it out. And then I started to learn what blockchain was. And holy shit, my world <laughs> opened up. Literally, for the most part of last year, I was watching YouTube videos, I was reading books, I was putting things on Facebook, I was pestering him pretty much every Daily. day. In fact, Ben helped me, and this is quite an embarrassing story, open my first ever an account with an exchange, which uh, was... But I mean, it, it's pretty tricky. I mean, if, you, if you've never done it before and if you yeah. haven't traded traditional stocks... Especially the exchange, we had to shares. open it on anyway. So, well, I, it I, hard work. so I learned how to buy some altcoins and I was getting really into this. But... I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business builder, so I've built a couple of companies. Um, most notably, I've built a plastic recycling business, so completely out of technology. But one of the things that I have learned is that understanding new technologies, um, even archaic technologies like pay-per-click and Google search, and applying them in a traditional business sense meant I won. I won against a lot of my competitors because I embrace new technologies and you probably sit here laugh now and think I'll oh, pay-per-click or Google or SEO or even having a blimmin website in, yeah. in the recycling well, there sector are, there are still is, businesses is, is kind of a, kind of a rarity so for me I don't care about the price of a coin I have no time for trading I think that day trading represents a great opportunity for some people if they want to get into that we tried it we tried it <laughs> Never again. Never again. Uh, it was a week was of sleepless horrific. nights, and we just went mad. Well, I mean, so we, and we learned how to do some arbitrage, and it's like, oh my god, it's actually really, really stressful, especially when you're it's running so two stressful. businesses and a po and a podcast so stressful. together. So um, that was that was fun. So yeah, for me, it's not about cryptocurrencies; it's about blockchain, and a cryptocurrency is just one use of blockchain. Yeah. So. Um, as you probably all know, today's subject, well, today's talk really is about um, pivoting business into blockchain. But what we wanted to do first is tell your story. And every good story um, has certain events yeah. that we can learn from. So our story is called Blockchain or Bus. Now, you might recognize one of those logos on there. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is a really interesting one. And I think for me, it's one of the biggest examples of a company that should have adopted a new technology, but didn't, uh, against advice and the markets. Um, and of course, it is the story of Blockbuster. Um, now, I've got the facts here. We're going to run, run through <laughs> them in order. So Blockbuster was uh, founded in 1985 and opened their first store in Dallas. Uh, Does anyone remember that? <laughs> <laughs> the blockbuster cards. The, yeah. yeah. Did anyone have a blockbuster card? Yeah. Did, any, did anyone ever use... Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that's it. It was... Yeah, VHS or... D, yeah. yeah. A, a VH what? A VHS. Oh, I do remember I mean, that the, yeah, yeah, old school. Old school. Uh, in 1994, Viacom acquired Blockbuster's for 8.4 billion, uh, which oh, was an enormous acquisition. I mean, this is kind of like the pre-tech days before the dot-com boom of uh, 1997. So this was a huge acquisition. Um, but we later find out that, that actually potentially not the greatest acquisition at all. Um, in 1997, a disgruntled customer walks into Blockbuster and returns Apollo 13. Um, what, the actual Apollo The 13? actual Apollo 13, oh, dragging it on a okay. 
again, uh, <laughs> takes the VHS back to the store, uh, and it was six weeks overdue. Now, I don't know if anybody remembers how bad the fees were at Blockbuster, but he incurred a $40 fee uh, for six weeks overdue. Um, now, uh, we, we later find out that the guy that returned this was Reed Hastings, uh, and in 1998, Reed Hastings went on to found Netflix. Uh, partly because, and he said this publicly, because he was petrified of telling his wife how much the fees were, uh, and he started thinking about how he could solve the problem, not just for himself, but also for, uh, for other people across well, the a, world. There's a lesson in that, isn't there? Don't, if you've got a business... Tell your wife there. everything. Oh, okay, that yes. one, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. No, there is. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, an, an interesting one. So he founded, uh, he founded Netflix, which was really focused on uh, the DVD market. Now, the DVD market at the time was absolutely minuscule. A DVD player back in 1998 cost about $1,000, uh, and only 1% of Americans actually had a DVD player. So it was, you know, it was, it was small by comparison. I, I remember when they were £1,000 in the shops. Yeah, easily. I mean, I remember easily. seeing And DVDs and were like, hard to get hold of, and right, the, the yeah. ranges were poor. So anyway, uh, Blockbuster at the time, you know, back in the glory days, I think they were worth about 4.5 billion around the time. They weren't interested in the DVD market, focusing on VHS, uh, and Reed Hastings was sort of left on the sidelines to sort of fly under the radar a bit. Um, now he built a pretty, uh, you know, pretty substantial business, and he actually went to Blockbuster in the year 2000 uh, with an offer to sell the business to Blockbuster. Uh, and the the monetary value of the sale. So should we let them guess? Or are you does, does anybody know how much the, the he w they wanted for Netflix in the year two thousand? They were trying to sell this to Blockbuster. It wasn't a pound. No, close. I mean, it, yeah, it was making a loss, so it probably should have been sold for a pound. Um, but no, it, it was actually only $50 million. Uh, and this was at a time where Blockbuster were worth about $4.5 billion. So it was, uh, it, you know, quite, a, quite an easy acquisition should they have gone ahead. Um, but actually what happened was the CEO of Blockbuster laughed them out of the room, said that it was a fad, it was ridiculous technology, no one's ever going to adopt this. And, uh, someone ne did. And somebody, <laughs> Netflix and Phil, somebody did. Um, <laughs> it, so uh, the year after that, uh, Viacom actually holds a public IPO for Blockbuster. Now Viacom, if you remember, bought Blockbuster for $8.4 billion and they registered the IPO at a valuation of 4.8, so almost half of what the acquisition was. Good or bad business? Uh, pretty, pretty terrible. Uh, in the year 2002, Blockbuster posts a $1.6 billion loss uh, as the DVD market climbs and VHS market starts to sink. Um, and um, it, it, an interesting thing, at the time Blockbuster, then desperately trying to catch up with Netflix, decided that they'd launch their own DVD delivery system. Uh, and they, they tried to compete, they, kind of, they, they came a close second, um, but Reed Hastings, who was uh, the CEO of Netflix and the founder at the time, he said that the battle with Blockbuster that year had been particularly difficult and they'd thrown absolutely everything at them, bar the kitchen sink. Um, and quite facetiously, the CEO of Blockbuster sent to Reed Hastings' home address a boxed kitchen sink. This very, um, this very sink. This, this very sink. Um, but actually, uh, the, the story for Netflix kind of uh, it gets a lot better from there. Uh, 2002, they posted a $1.6 billion loss. So that's Blockbuster. 2003, Netflix posts their first profit of $6.5 million. Uh, and then eventually, running all the way through to 2010, uh, Blockbuster posted their final loss of $1.1 billion uh, with a, a total valuation of just $24 million. And, wow. they, and they closed their doors uh, in 2010. Uh, and Netflix, as we probably all know, is uh, now a, a gigantic company in the space. Ready um, to be disrupted, no re doubt. Ready to be disrupted, yeah. we think. Uh, so yes, that's, that's the, uh, the very interesting story, I think, of Blockbuster versus Netflix. And it's just a really key example of a company that probably shouldn't have ignored disruptive technology. Um, and this is kind of the point of what we're talking about today, is that this is a lesson which we've learned. Blockchain, I think, is probably akin to DVD was in... Yeah, I think even more so. For me, I think blockchain is the greatest innovation since the start of the internet, really, on, on consumer, on mass scale. Um, and there's going to be loads of examples of Blockbuster that are going to be happening over the next few years. 
Maybe it'll be Netflix. I mean, we've got companies like TV2 um, yeah. that, that are coming out. Yeah, definitely. That, that they've, they're looking at a blockchain solution to disrupt the way that we consume videos and you've paid to watch TV and their own native token. And that's going to be really exciting. We've got uh, Tata2 as well, which historically raised, I think, was it? An five astronomical five sum of money. million yeah. I uh, mean, dollars in an not ICO. Not to get into the debate of ICOs, okay. but I think that that's... We're not doing ICOs just yet. Too much. Yeah. So, sure. so it's going to be really interesting to see who the casualties are. Um, and what we've always said is that if, if there is a large business out there, a, a Netflix, why aren't they setting up a little squad, a side project, to actually try and put themselves out of business themselves? Sure. Because you're better to have someone, uh, you better put yourself out of business than someone else do it for you. Yep, absolutely right. All right. Um, so we've spoken about. Uh, Th this example and yes what is a so pivot this is does anyone can anyone sort of shed some light on what they think a pivot might be in a, in a business or an example of that yeah. yeah yeah definitely yeah, absolutely yeah yeah I think I think the key thing with a pivot is uh, specifically for tech businesses actually is if you are on a very clear trajectory uh, and all of a sudden a new tech comes into the space, something which could uh, improve or enhance your product offering for your customer, it's about making the decision to almost turn the ship and start moving in that direction, which again, going back to the blockbuster example, is something which they didn't really do. I think the really interesting thing about pivoting is if we use the ship an analogy is that the bigger the ship, the more difficult and slower it is to turn and move direction. Sure. Well, when you're a little dinghy, meaning a startup or something, it means you can be nimble and you can move mm -hmm. and you can change direction. So I think it is very hard for existing large businesses to change and adapt. Um, and it's also a fear factor for them as well because, you know, the CEO or the board have got to say, right, we're going to take this direction. And that, that can actually be quite scary as well. So yep. any businesses out there, I think you should just be looking at this and assessing what you can do. Absolutely. So there's many sectors, and we'll go on to some of the examples of, of um, good sectors and good business opportunities to use blockchain in a moment. But there's also some really awful, bad examples, awful reasons to use blockchain and yes. maybe create your own token or cryptocurrency. And boy, don't we know it. Well, we, um, we, we have are... uh, projects come to us daily. Uh, some of them are good and some of them are terrible. And it's becoming more difficult to find really amazing yeah. projects that we think that are going to be hugely successful. Yeah, I think um, the lesson that we learned is that uh, blockchain isn't uh, exactly as Samson Williams, who came on the podcast, said. Yeah. he said, blockchain is not hot sauce. You can't put it on everything. Uh, and we had... Uh, one project come to us, which, believe it or not, was a donkey sanctuary that had decided to launch their own donkey sanctuary coin. So has anyone invested in donkey coin? Or? No. Well, right. we lost our shirt on that investment. So it's we just me to... on that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I, I just thought they were, you know, quite cute. And yeah, really to have sure. That. There's nothing well, wrong with the donkey says, sanctuary. Nothing wrong but with the donkey sanctuary. But do they need sanctuary. a token? What are they trying to do? Why are they using distributed ledger technology? Sure. What's the purpose of the token? What problem does it solve? Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't really. So you don't want to apply it to absolutely everything. No. Um, and there's, there's been some quite interesting cryptocurrencies that are quite well known out there. Um, do we have any Ripple fans here at all? No? Okay. No? All right. So all no right. more. Silence. Uh, yeah, so no more. So we're, we're, yeah, we, we come across lots of different projects. And uh, we have some key markers for things that we look at, which really is what, what the, the, the problem that's trying to be solved and, um, yeah. and how they're implementing the block, blockchain technology, what the tokens are going to be used for. Um, I know... John, in, in, in the last talk, you, you spoke about um, tokens that don't have a utility. And I was sat there thinking, oh, my God, yes, there are so many projects that don't necessarily have a utility. And it's fine to have a utility token. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we've seen some really good projects that have a utility token. And the, va the utility value of that is pegged to a certain amount to be used on the platform. Mm -hmm. um, which is fine, but obviously security tokens where you can take equity in a business as well are out there too. So just some of the things you do. Sure. Um, so uh, that does say block. It, this blockchain. says blockchain. <laughs> it at does the bottom. say blockchain. So um, we took some advice from this guy. Yeah. Good reasons to pivot um, into blockchain. Yeah, he was he was very confident. Wasn't he? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I think the thing for us is uh, if, if a business is pivoting into blockchain, it's got to have a reason to do so. So we look at some of the bad examples that we talk about, Donkey Sanctuary Coin. Uh, <laughs> there's just no need for a token. Um, and actually, blockchain does a lot more than just exchanging value. It's a distributed ledger, and the technology actually can be used for, for, for a number of different things. Um, and actually, we've got some examples, I think, haven't we, of some of the sectors which we think specifically uh, are going to be affected by blockchain technology. Yeah, definitely. Maybe you want to talk about your industry. So for those who don't know, this chap here, he has... Um, built a really interesting business in the music sector um, and uh, you were looking at how blockchain technology can improve that sector in some way. Yeah, so sure. Uh, so yeah, I, w I work in the music sector. That's kind of my my day to day job. Uh, but, but yeah, I think music is one of the spaces where blockchain technology is fundamentally needed. Um, there's a lot of issues with getting royalties paid to musicians uh, and also transparency in where music is being played and how musicians are being compensated. Uh, and blockchain technology, by kind of opening it up as a distributed ledger with information that's accessible by everyone that's part of that ecosystem, is a really huge benefit to not just musicians, but also to the record labels that work in that space. Um, and that's just one use of blockchain in music. I mean, there's, there's numerous others from streaming and service delivery. Uh, I, th I think it's, it's probably... Uh, you know, a couple of years away, music traditionally has been quite slow to adopt new technologies. Uh, the labels have been running quite fast to, to get on board with streaming. But sure. it, it, well, we've it's seen the first good. record label that's been bought out on the blockchain, mm. Hunter Court Records, have, uh, have got a, uh, an ecosystem that they've developed and they've actually already signed some uh, pretty well-known artists as well yeah. on that. So that's going to be something really exciting. So we think the music industry in particular but we've got loads of others. So charities is one. Um, so needed. Yeah. Exactly. It's so needed. When you donate your money, I, I, who here donates to charity on a regular basis? Mm. So how many of you know actually how much of that money goes to the cause? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. It's, it's a very small amount, yeah. I mean, administration costs are huge. Yeah. Um, and you never quite know that it's solving the problem that We've it's We've seen some to be. horrific examples on the news, of, certainly this year, very recently. Um, where uh, money that's been given to charities to centralise organisations hasn't been used correctly. Yeah. One of the really exciting things that I think blockchain can do is uh, to use smart contracts to actually send money directly to projects and remove a lot of this bloat. I mean, some of the yeah. bloat in these organisations is is huge. They have enormous staffing costs. And, I, and believe me, I, I haven't got a problem with, with charities paying staff, but when I, I, and I won't name the charity, but I give a reasonable amount each month to them and every other month I get a letter or a phone call or more marketing to say, will you donate more? And it's really inefficient and very expensive. And I can't really find out how much of that money goes to the, the cause that I want to support. So blockchain can do that through smart contracts. We've seen a few charities. Um, we've actually had one on the podcast that's trying to do something for the homeless. So we'll see how that project goes. So there's uh, loads of things it can do there. Yeah. Uh, shipping, logistics, supply chain. Um, we've actually huge had use uh, case. yeah we've had a huge use case a number of different projects on the podcast with logistics and supply chain mm. where they can actually monitor and track items and remove a lot of inefficiencies as well. Yeah. So that's very exciting. I also think it's important to say that uh, although there's a lot of use cases for blockchain technology. Uh, actually, a lot of the businesses that we see uh, utilizing blockchain have never been in business before. I mean, they, they're really coming into business for the first time using blockchain technology and actually um, are still restricted by the same boundaries as most startups. Um, and I think it's a little bit similar to the dot-com boom in that a lot of these blockchain companies uh, will probably not succeed. Um, and it's, the, it's probably going to be the, the innovators that have business experience that will, will do well with it. Yeah, and um, if, again, not investment advice, but if, if you're looking at good projects that you may want to buy tokens in, one of the things that Ben and I do for our own, we have a, we have a joint crypto fund, is we look at the, the founders of the business, what their experience is. If they have any experience. And quite often they don't. You know, they're, they're potentially quite young or inexperienced, haven't run a business before, mm. and they're trying to disrupt 
you know, a multi million or sometimes with hundreds, billi of, billions, hundreds yeah. of billion industry and they've had no experience in that sector and no credible business experience behind them. So for us, that's a potential red flag. And I know there's always the, these anecdotal examples of, you know, you Mark Zuckerbergs and the uh, Larry and Google guys. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And um, Jeff. Jeff, Jeff Uncle Jeff, Uncle Jeff. Call him. Yeah. Yeah, un yeah, Jeff Bezos. But, you know, they are they are absolute standouts. So we want to actually see who's behind the business. Um, and some of these some of these logistics and supply chain projects as we've spoken uh, with actually have a business already, but they recognize the problems and they've built another business on the side to say, OK, well, maybe my business here does have a lifespan where I can build the life raft and I can move over and pivot and change into Sure. into a blockchain uh, focus uh, business. Um, another one is health records as well, which, which I think is... Yeah, I uh, mean, that, that's a huge, huge problem in the US, uh, especially in with US, private health care. Sure, yeah, I think, I, think it's a, I think it's definitely a bigger problem. But, um, I mean, I don't know where my NHS records are. I've moved around the country. Or I've lived overseas for a short amount of time as well. Um, and I don't... I'm very skeptical that all my medical records are up to date and they're my records. They should come with me. Yeah. But instead they're on some NHS database somewhere. Sure. And I can't really access them when I, when I want to, I can request it, but I can't go there now. And who's to say that the records are up to date and correct? Secure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is another important thing with the use case of blockchain is data sovereignty. And I think there, are, cer yeah. there are certain aspects of data in our day to day lives that we take for granted. Uh, and I think healthcare data is one of those. And I think that we need to take ownership of that information and at least know where it is. Definitely. So for us as entrepreneurs, this is a really exciting time. I feel like I've been given an opportunity that I was too young to have during the, the, the dot com boom. Um, I think that Ben and I have got an exciting project that we're working on together um, called CoSound, which will perhaps tell you, if perhaps. we come back to one of the events or another event, we'll go into a bit more detail about then. Um, but for me, this is a tool. It's a tool for good and it's a tool for change. Hi, thanks for the warm welcome. Um, we are Dutch, so my English accent isn't as beautiful as all the other speakers you have heard today. It's rather crappy a little bit. But I will introduce my family. This is my beautiful daughter, Jolie. She's 13 years old. She just went 13. Juna, she's 11. Jessa, she's 8. And my beautiful wife, Roman. Um, just want to have an applause for them. They supported me through all this amazing Bitcoin journey we have been doing, trading. Oh, she had to sell all her shoes. It was 70, 70 pair. <laughs> She sold her toys, her bike, their quad. She, they sold all the um, luxury stuff they had. We had been spoiling my family a lot. They had everything they needed. And we just wanted to teach them a new life lesson about minimalism and being happy with all, without having a lot of money. So thanks. Daddy is up to it again alone. And I need to work. You can enjoy. Go shopping. Victoria's Secret. or. Well. <laughs> Um, so again, my name is Didi Tanyutu. Um We are bound to the Bitcoin family. I have welcome for you, uh, here. The story I'm going to tell you is just a story about my life. I'm always um, speaking at those um, events. And people also always ask me, what are you going to tell them? And I've fig been figuring out myself, what, should, what can I tell them? I will tell you my life. I will tell you um, how I got into crypto, why we went all in, why my wife um, accepted this crazy idea of when, uh, going all in and my opinion about cryptocurrency and about uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin private and all the other cryptos around in the world. So it all started um, back in 2002. This is my beautiful mother and I was at that point 24 years in my life. I was eating dinner at home with my mother and we having, every Wednesday we're having this uh, family dinner. My brother, my sister, my mother, my father, and we had, she cooked and we ate. At the end of this dinner, we hugged and said, hey, see you tomorrow again, mom. Bye. See you tomorrow. At 1.30 in the night, my brother called me and he was Diddy. My mom stopped, uh, stopped breathing. And I could hear his voice that it was really serious. So I threw away the telephone, stepped into my car, raced to my father. The ambulance was already there. 
I, I walked into my father and he was like, Didi, she's gone, she's gone. And I'm like, why she's gone? They are st still getting her back. They are, they are helping her. And I was, went up to my mother there and she was on the ground in the kitchen. And then they told me she fell down and she was gone. She was in coma for seven days. And after those seven days, she died, 48 years old. So at these points in your life, you always have this same question. What do I want from life? Do I want to continue my life? I just lost my mother. Do I want to <laughs> jump off the bridge? <laughs> do I want to take care of my brother or my sister? Do I need to help my father? What, what do I need to do? Um, for me, this answer on this question was simple. I started working. I became a workaholic. I started working that much that I built up a camp company. Um, we had, at the end, we had 16 employees. Everything was going fine. I built up the second company. We had 12 employees there as well. Then I thought, man, I'm almost at the top of the world. I started mining because there was a guy telling me about Bitcoin and I was like, Bitcoin? This was in 2000, um, around 2012. So my company had been involved to a big company, a big um, office building and everything. And I had some empty spaces and this guy was telling me about, hey, did you hear about Bitcoin? And I was like, no, tell me. It's a revolution. We are going to change the world. We are going to disrupt the system. And I was like, okay, this sounds fine to me. So can we make money with it? Because I wanted to be a millionaire, a very young millionaire. That was my goal in life, becoming a millionaire. And what happened is that I started mining Bitcoin. And when the crash, the first crash came from $1,200 to $200, I started mining Dogecoin. I love Dogecoin. Uh, millions of them, I thought that was go Everybody told me, Didi, Dogecoin will go to 10 cents. So I'm like, okay, so I 30, 30 million bit the dough coins, 10 cents, yeah, I will be fine. But then the crash came and I sold my mining rigs, I sold everything, and I just started um, focusing on my uh, company again. But I got bored. Two companies, doing it for a long time, I needed something new. I took a third job, I, took, I became an affiliate manager and afterwards a brand manager for online casino business in Malta. I had to travel a lot, I saw all the big clubs in the world, London was my favorite, district it was called. I was really on top of the world. I was making pictures with the Bentleys and I had my six bottle of Belvedere bottles. I thought this was the goal in life, I succeeded. In my opinion, I succeeded. But then it was 2014, end of the year, Christmas, my father called me and he said, Didi, are you sitting? I said, yeah, I'm driving my car, what's up dad? I just came from the hospital, I have just one year to live, I have cancer. I said, what? Again, in my car, racing home, hugging my dad, crying a lot. It's not true. You cannot just go in one year. We have to go to another hospital and another hospital, and we have to research, and, and we did. But finally, we found out that the, the, the type of cancer he had was not treatable. We could extend his life a little bit with one year, and so we did. So I joined enjoyed this year with my father, 2015. I stopped working, I stopped my companies, I hired a manager to take care of all these things, and I just focused on my father, my brother, my sister, my family. We did our last holiday, our last Christmas. You know all those things you want to do with your father if you know that you are going to die. My father was different. He was a professional football player, and he was the type of guy who was not, I'm a trainer now, and I will train till I die. I'm going to be on this field till I die. But I wanted to have all this time together with my father. And he was like, no, I'm going to die, but I need to spend this time the, the way I like it. My passion, football. So there are a lot of conflicts in this year, but there was a lot of beautiful times as well. Then, in uh, 2016, January, I woke up, I brought him some coffee, and he started to have breathing problems again. He died. I was next to him. He died, he was 61 years old. I, at that point, was 38. I started thinking, again, shit, what do I want from life? Again, on the same point. I have everything I want. I can buy anything I want, but I couldn't save my father. If I would have been a billionaire, I wouldn't have saved my father. And then something struck me, something, Didi, you're enjoying life, but it's a one-man show, but you're a family man. Where is your family in this show? I wanted to spend more time with my kids. I, till that point, my oldest daughter was 10. I haven't 
hadn't even seen her grow up. It was just working, working, making, working, money, money, but. So I changed. So then what happened is, okay, this time I will make the good decision. I will sell my car, uh, my company. I sold my company direct. And after selling my company um, and the other company and quitting my management job and everything, um, of course, the nicest thing in my life happened, I got a burnout. Because if you're used to working a lot of high level energy, then you fall down and you're, psh, you're empty. Brushing my tooth was like the highest energy point in my life at that point. It was like I couldn't do anything. I was like this Siri junk in, in the mornings watching these Netflix shows till at one or two the kids came home and I was still watching this same series. So then I just thought, okay, now I have to change. I have to really change my life. And we sold everything, so we had some money. So I decided to start traveling. So Asia, here we come. I told my wife, let's take backpacks, go to Asia, just take a time off. I need to reset, you know? The, the, the burnout was the craziest things what happened to me was I was driving in my car through during this time. I didn't know it was a burnout and my heart started like, oh, this pressure on my, on my chest. It was like, it was hurting. So I had to pull over the car and I had to give my telephone to one of the kids when if something happens, just dial 112 in Holland, you dial 112. So this was like a strange situation. I still didn't believe it was a burnout. I went home, I told my wife and she was like, ah, Didi, you have to go to a doctor. And I still was like, no, man, it's just a, it's, it will go over. But Monday, it happened again. I went to the doctor and he said, Didi, you need to relax. So that is what I did. I went to Asia, we were <laughs> relaxing. I was enjoying the beautiful beach. I loved my hammock. I did spent hours thinking in that hammock, what will I do with my life? The question I needed to answer for myself, but also for my family and also for um, other people in the world. Because I discovered that a lot of people are walking with the same question. Is this everything? Is, this any, is there more? Blah, blah. So I needed to figure this out. And then I came to me, minimalism, versus the rat race cycle. Am I still going to work, get a lot of income, pay the bills, fancy lifestyle, no savings, debit loans, working harder again? Am I going to continue this cycle? Or am I going to choose to be happy with what we have? And during this um, holiday, um, we discovered that we were very happy with just two backpacks. Nothing luxury. Yeah, my iPhone was the most luxury item we had. And we were enjoying life to the fullest. I was enjoying my kids running on the beach. They were learning so much and I enjoyed it. And I would, ne would have never expected from me to enjoy something little like that. I thought enjoying was being the district London on this bar. But then I started to realize this is enjoying life. So I started to talk with my wife and finally we said, Let's go all in. She said, but how can you as a materialistic, materialistic man go all in? And I said, we just need to. All in crypto at that point. Um, of course, at first, it's a discussion with your wife. All in? Is, it, what, is, what, does, what is all in, Didi? So yeah, all in is all in. So cars, everything, uh, house, you have to prove it. That was the answer. I said, OK. I took my Jeep Cherokee, put it online for sale, sold it in January bought bitcoins. Second car, sold it, bought bitcoins. Motorcycle, sold it, bought bitcoins. And then eventually she started believing me, okay, he really wants to change life. She was always the Zen factor in our family. She was always, hey, be normal, then you're weird enough. Um, be, be normal, then you're crazy enough. I think it's in English, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So um, she helped me adapting this new lifestyle. Being happy with flip-flops, I don't have any fancy shoes anymore, sorry. <laughs> this is the first time in eight months I wear jeans. This is a special event for me. Um, but we went all in, so we went all in. We, we sold our house. We, went, we flew back from ba Bali to the Netherlands. I went to a real estate broker and said, I want to sell my, my house. And yeah, it's okay, he said, uh, but I want to sell it for Bitcoins. And then this system started, Bitcoins? You, you cannot sell a house for Bitcoins. What are Bitcoins? You cannot sell for Bitcoins. But how are we going to do with the notary? How are we going to do with your um, finances at the bank? And I started, let's try it. Let's shake up this business, do it, and let's see what happens after. And if it happens after, I will handle it after. And that's what we did. And that worked. Um, why did we go all in? To be very clear, we didn't go in for Lambos and for Mooning. 
<laughs> not at all. And for me, it was a life change. It was not to become this millionaire, but a life change. Um, and we thought the world needed a change. You know, a, a I love the revolution part, but also an evolution. So, uh, you, you know, we already saw in the presentation from stones to gold to, to this cash money, to this cards, to PayPal, to bit. Coin cash, private, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we really believe this is going to happen. And we believed this very strongly two years ago already. And that's why we went all in. We, we, we just wanted to change life. And with this bag of money, we couldn't do anything. The banks were give, weren't giving me any interest anymore. So pff, I didn't have any lust of putting my money to those guys. So we chose for crypto. For us, the reasons to invest in Bitcoin and other, all other crypto, crypto are freedom, financial and independency, transparent decentralized processes, trust, trust is very uh, important, privacy, because there will be a huge shift of trust. It's, I think, the biggest shift in history of trust, people having to trust each other again instead of having to trust a third party. Um, so there will be a lot of things happening in the world outside of crypto that will change the world as well. Privacy, and of course, to kick some ass. We just wanted to disrupt the current unfair, in our opinion, unfair monetary system. We wanted to be system, the monetary system should belong to everybody. Everybody should be, be able to have a bank account. Everybody has to be able to send money to their family where, the, where they are on the world without high fees. People need to know that there is not enough cash money in the world to cash out. If we all cash out, I think it's 3% tomorrow, there isn't enough cash money out of this ATM machine. There isn't. So this is not right. This has to change. So that's why. So, and then, of course, the media get, get, got a little bit sense of it, and they were like, this is a strange family. They are selling their house. They are going to live on a campsite and offer Bitcoin. Something is... We don't even know what it is. So they bombed us to the Bitcoin family. Um, and we had to think about this. Are we going to accept this role? Bitcoin family, what, what does it even mean? Don't they want to make a brand? People were writing me fan mail. They were writing me all strange of things. And we were like living in a campsite, like doing nothing, <laughs> just waiting for the crypto boom. And, but it became more and more and poor. And people started asking questions. And how do you do it with education of the kids? And how do you do this? And how do you travel all the life? And how do you pay with crypto? This was a big trip for us. Two years ago, we couldn't pay with crypto. We, we, we needed to exchange crypto back to money on a bank and pay with money again. Now, I, recently, yesterday, I visited Wirex, for example. I, I just transferred my, with my app. It takes two seconds, and I pay with my Wirex card over everywhere in the world. This is a step in between, of course. At the end, I hope that every store in London and all over the world will accept, accept crypto, just paying with my Bitcoin wallet or whatever. So but we came, became the Bitcoin family. And why did we do it? Because we could have easily gone sitting on this beach the rest of our life, zipping my cocktails, coconuts, and just do nothing and be happy till um, we die. But 38. At that point, 40 years old, I thought, nah, maybe a little bit too young to not support this amazing revolution that's going on. So let's go. Let's try it. Let's give it a try. Again, a discussion with the wife. Are we going to do it? Are we going to be this brand? And to be honest, it goes with ups and downs. It's not easy to be a Bitcoin family because you get a lot of negative, uh, negativism about, uh, on you, positive people as well, but hate mails, everything. So, and... Becoming this Bitcoin family, we were in Thailand at that point, and there was a show that called Arte, and they were making a documentary about us, so we said, oh, let's do it. We said yes to everything, because we thought in life, to change life, you need to say, start yesing, saying yes. We always said no. And now we started thinking, okay, let's say yes. Let's open those doors, walk through the door, see what is there. Do we like it? I will stay. Don't, I don't like it. I will go back, close this door. The people are always afraid that if they went, if they go through this door, and if they want to go back, there is nothing left. <laughs> There's always something. And if not, you go to the left or to the right again. It's, it's very easy to live your life. 
So we, we became the Bitcoin family, and then in Thailand, we had some documentaries, and then some companies started calling us, oh, do you want to do a tour in Europe? I said, okay, let's do a tour in Europe. So they ordered us a camper van. It was sponsored by a few companies on here. And they told us, do this European tour and start talking about Bitcoin to people and everything. So we visited a lot of beautiful places, um, making pictures with my Bitcoin hats, of course, trying to convince people that Bitcoin is normal, that Bitcoin is going mainstream, slowly going mainstream, but it's going to be accepted everywhere. And I'm going there. I'm going to all the small places and um, check them. I went into the silver mines and teach my kids, kids okay, wh what is the difference between silver, gold, and bitcoins? I fought the bears in Norway. It was a real hard, hard fight. I went to the top when bitcoin dropped below 6,000. I thought, I'll just climb the hill and just vlog that I'm on top again, and bitcoin will be at top soon as well. So all these things, bitcoin shops, paying in bars with bitcoins, we are trying to vlog about them and just educate people because this is really important now, educating people that bitcoin and crypto is going to be the next step in the evolution of money. And I like to prepare people that, I like to have people not miss out this boom, which they already missed out in the dot-com bubble that time. So we were in a lot of newspapers, television shows, um, just to give you a, a small view from what our kids and family went through. We were invited to the television shows and the, the kids were bombed in those television shows. They were asked questions like, why don't you go to school? Because they are now homeschooled, unschooled. I'm preparing them for, for a very decentral future, <laughs> not for a future where the normal schools are preparing the kids at this point. Different discussion. But um, there's a, an English guy who has a very beautiful view about it, and uh, we just wrote a book, and he's in the book as well. Um, Ken Robinson is his name, and just check him on Google, and you will never send your kids to school again. Um, there was made a documentary by Arte. It was, made, it was viewed more than a million times. I met a president. There was the president of, uh, of, of Lieberland. Have you heard of Lieberland? We know him. You know Lieberland? Yeah, yeah. OK. We are libertarian. You are libertarian as well. So uh, yeah, for, the, for, the, for, the, for those who don't know Lieberland, it's the guy behind this silly cartoon people made of me. I'm becoming a Bitcoin uh, superhero or something. But this guy, Lieberland, he's, he's creating this uh, um, uh, country between Serbia and uh, Bosnia, I think. And it's a small country, but it's liberty. You can get a passport and everything. Um, no taxes, no school system, no nothing, but it wants to set people free that are digital nomads, people traveling on the world. Check them, Lieberland, it's, it's really cool. Um, so yeah, then there was a guy sending me this bit uh, cartoon, Didi, you're, the, you're out your suit, you're, you're coming out the closet again. <laughs> <That's>, uh, nah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, um, then I became an ICO advisor, and everything became more and more. It started to become a job again. Became advised for a lot of companies, Deep uh, Decoin, uh, Deep Arrow, Decent Bet, Money Token, Bitcoin Private, uh, GIF, and all those companies want the same. They want to support crypto. They want to support crypto going mainstream. I don't understand all the discussions nowadays. If I tweet something about Bitcoin Private, the Verge community is positive, but all the other communities are like, well, how can you shill Bitcoin Private? How can you shill Verge? How can you shill this? It's not about chilling. This, this whole community, this whole crypto is not, this has not been born because of hate. It has born because of love, because of becoming a community, sharing one communion, a cumo, a coin, being strong together. This is where crypto is about, not about fighting Bitcoin cash and Bitcoin. I don't understand this fight. I think it's pre-planned because else I cannot understand this fight. But okay. So I think people have to be, bring more positive energy in it so that new people that see the Twitters and that see the Facebook and see all those messages will think, okay, it's a safe environment, it's a normal environment, it's not a childish environment where people throw mud all the time at each other because people won't step in this business. It won't go mainstream if we just keep fighting about who has the beautiful color and who is the best company. It's, they are all different, not better, not worse, different. But they all support crypto and that's what you need to understand. Of course, not the scam companies, there are a lot, but in general, the most crypto uh, companies want to support it. So then there was a company, uh, do you, uh, are you going to write a book? Of course, <laughs> I, I will do some more work. I will start writing a book. And I started writing a book. And the book will um, 
also be out in English. I think it's from the 1st of September. It will be in English and German. It's just about a life, but also about how to trade crypto and what is crypto, what is blockchain, just education, uh, educating people again. I'm talking a lot about things I'm doing to make money again. <laughs> well, I swore to myself I wouldn't do it again, but this time is different. I'm making this money to share it. Of all and everything we earn, 50% goes to foundation, crypto education, but I will bring it there myself because I don't trust all these charity companies yet till there come Still, there is one company that makes a really beautiful blockchain charity uh, product. So I will travel there and I will give the money to this school or to this, to Bali, for instance, now where there's a lot of uh, problems. I will fly there. If I, if I collect 5,000 euros and I fly there for 500 euros, they still have 4,500 euros left. I think this is more than if I send it there to a company that starts to pay people again, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's a good idea for the next product, maybe. So um, this is how we became the Bitcoin family. For me, it's very easy. The secret of happiness is freedom. The secret of freedom is courage. People do not live in fear. Just live. Just try something new every day. Just do it. Just go for it. Nothing will happen. You will not die. <laughs> you will die if you don't do this. You will get stressed and you will get diseases about it. Just try to live life. So, and referral to my father and mother who showed me how to travel. I'm the small guy there on, on the, my father's shoulder. My father always, and my mother always said, dare to live life. So I think now that I understand what they meant with dare to live life. And I will share this knowledge again with my kids, but also with you guys, everywhere where I can. Dare to live life. Man, I just heard a, a, a talk here of our two guys doing a crypto show. I, I can imagine if you start doing this show, you're like, how will people think about me on, on, on this YouTube? How, how, how will they react? What will they do? What will they say? Will they be negative? Will they be positive? Can I still walk outside if they are very positive? Just do it and see after. You, you cannot predict the future. You cannot change the past. Just do it and try it and stop it if you don't like it anymore. It's easy. It's very easy. So if you want to support us in supporting other companies and people that are needing, um, you can visit our Facebook, our Instagram. Um, it's all called the Bitcoin family. You can also mail me. Um, you can also donate BTC if you want for Bitcoins. <laughs> Is it scannable from this distance? No. But um, there are many options. You can find on our website as well that everything we receive and we bring to other people, we will start vlogging about this. So I, you won't find me on Instagram vlogging about my new Lamborghini or whatever, you will find me vlogging about the money I will bring to these causes. And I think that we as a family uh, find that as a goal in our life. Sticky. So if we get money, we will bring it there and we will share it with you through YouTube. I prefer DLive or DTube because they are decentralized or Steemit, for example. Um, but that is what um, our family is now at this point. Most of the times is what I look like developing. Sometimes I hold my keyboard that way. Um, depends on how my day's going. Uh, if it's going really bad, I tend to look like this. Um, especially when a bug or issue crops up, such as things not working. Um, but usually you end up fixing the bug and you end up feeling like a rock star, ninja, guru, developer. All the horrible industry terms all mashed up into one. But no matter whether it's going well or bad, uh, the most important thing is to keep calm and code on, keep developing things, working out problems, maybe step away from the computer, you'll figure it out, come back and code awesome solutions. So that's kind of what I do. Um, I've done that for maybe 20 years now. Uh, I was a developer uh, that started off in the dot-com boom, um, the bubble, if you like, that was in the 90s. So. I was producing solutions for small companies and sort of worked my way up to big global companies, blue chips, multinationals, organizations, um, governments around the world. I've worked for many governments too. Um, and over the last 20 years, I've produced probably an estimated 500 solutions, websites, web apps, et cetera, for maybe three, 400 different clients. Um, this probably looks quite complicated because it is. There's a lot to uh, know and it's always changing. It's it's difficult to keep up to date, but that's what I like as a developer, is developing and keeping up to date with solutions and building things for people who have got ideas. 
So being a web developer, uh, building up a small pot of money, I wanted to invest in something. It suited me and my inner nerd nature to look at, you know, what's, how can I invest in something and be in control of it? And started to hear more and more about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Um, and I actually started really to look into Bitcoin about here, which is about May last year. So May 2017. So I kind of missed this whole period of what happened before people producing solutions and the, the nerds and the geeks who were really into the crypto side and the, the cypherpunks who produced these amazing solutions. I kind of joined it for the right reason for um, gaining investment. Um, looking back now, we can see, and you probably are quite familiar with this chart, for many years, it didn't really go anywhere. People kind of traded between themselves. The value didn't go up too much. And we saw it just about the time that I joined in May and got involved in cryptocurrency. There's this big sweep upwards in value. And that kind of, I didn't anticipate that was going to happen, but I got into it then. Um, I got into trading. I discovered I'm quite a bad trader. Um, I've put my money into things. I've made a little bit of money here, lost a lot there. Overall, I'm probably slightly up, maybe break even. But uh, I've learned a lot about myself, and I shouldn't probably day trade. So I'm more of a hodler now, if you like. Um, so the early phase, looking back at the chart now, we can think of it in a few different phases. The phase over there with the guy with the big beard is kind of what I think is the nerdy phase, the, the real nerds that sit in front of the computer come up with ideas. Days on end, they'll be coding away, coming up with um, secure solutions. They're the kind of innovators of Bitcoin. Then we head into a new phase with the hipsters, the people who are in it for profit, the early adopters, the entrepreneurs, the people who can spot real business opportunity. But still, nothing happens for many, many years. I joined in this kind of monetary phase, which we're probably all quite aware of. Uh, I think when I joined and got into Bitcoin, Bitcoin was about $800. And we saw this big sweep upwards towards Christmas and December, and it went up to almost $20,000. So this was um, a huge uprise. And of course, everybody was thinking, well, that's going to continue. Next year is going to keep going up, and this is the future. Uh, and it indeed is the future. But we didn't anticipate it going down and down. And it's all having this bear market, whether you're in Bitcoin or altcoins. Um, there's been this big bear downtrend for months on end. So I can use the laser. Um, this is the monetary period I kind of entered into, and I believe, like a lot of people, it's going to keep going up, and this was the future. Fiat will be dead in a couple of years. We know that's not quite the case, and it might run side by side, as John said earlier. So we head into a new phase. This confused a lot of people. Why is Bitcoin gone up to 20 grand? And then it started coming down and down. Surely it must go up. We've seen a few periods where it sort of swept upwards. We thought, this is the future again, and it sort of came down again. So it's left a lot of people confused. Why did we go up to 20,000? And why have we sunk back down? Why is it not going anywhere? And it started to dawn on me, well, what is cryptocurrency? And I looked into the technology, like a lot of people. Uh, you know, which coins have got which technology, which are offering which, which features do they have? And it occurred to me, I think February, May time, that people were concentrating a lot on the crypto word but they weren't concentrating enough on the second word, currency. It needs to have both the technology and the usage as well. You can't just have fantastic technology that no one uses. It doesn't make any sense. So I read Satoshi Nakamoto's um, white paper on Bitcoin. Can we have a show of hands to see how many people have actually read this in the room? Be honest. About half of you, that's quite good. So for those that don't know, it's an eight-page document that describes um, a revolutionary uh, new form of money that would be decentralized. People could trade between themselves. You don't need a middleman. Uh, transaction costs would be lower. And best of all, it would be fraud proof um, because the public ledger is out there. People can see the transactions that have happened. So again, going back to the cryptocurrency word, are people forgetting the currency part? If we look at the very heading we've got within Satoshi's white paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. People keep forgetting about the cash system bit. They concentrate on the fantastic technology, and we've got so much great technology, but we need usage. 
So it started to occur to me that the average person, this guy who's a baker, he is unable to sell his bread for cryptocurrency. He has to accept cash or card because that's a de facto standard. And that's okay, but Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, as we have heard from our speakers, have got a lot of advantages that debit cards, credit cards, and indeed cash don't have. There's a lot of fraud with those. It's easy to trick. It's a centralized system. It's controlled by um, governments and fewer parties than we'd like. So there weren't enough merchant services for this guy, the baker, to sell his bread for cryptocurrency. Similarly, this looks like a lot of people who have invested in cryptocurrencies and they've gone down and down. He's put his money into this, thinking it was going to keep going upwards. It's not. His money is now stuck in cryptocurrency. So this is not a good solution. It's not a good scenario. We have the baker who can't sell cryptocurrency because there are no services. And we have the user who doesn't want to spend it because it's less than perhaps he paid for it. So it'd be a waste of money. But it all comes back to there being not enough mainstream services. If there were services available for businesses to be able to sell with cryptocurrencies, new people would get on board. New people would be interested. The value would go up. And it would be a cycle of businesses selling and customers buying. This is the way the world works, especially regarding business. A great analogy is the can you buy a cup of coffee with cryptocurrency scenario. I'm not sure if you've all heard of this, but there's a couple of real problems, and it's a great way to illustrate whether a cryptocurrency is useful. A couple of the problems faced by it are, OK, let's buy it with, say, Bitcoin. Let's say the shop accepts Bitcoin, but they don't want to give you the cup of coffee until they've accepted payment, and that's confirmed in their bank. Bitcoin, you may not know, has 10-minute block times. So unlike a credit card or debit card or even cash where you pay for it and it's done within a couple of seconds, you might have to wait 10 minutes for a transaction to go through. If the merchant is pretty tight, they would say, well, no, you cannot have your coffee until I've received my payment. So let's say they wait for the, the payment to go through. It's accepted. The merchant then says, here you go. You can have your coffee now, in which case the customer says, well, it's cold. I don't want it anymore. Um, the other major issue faced by it is the cup of coffee might be 2 or $3. dollars. We've seen in the past that Bitcoin under network stress, the transaction costs can go, go way up, and it might be a few dollars. The merchant is not going to pay more in transaction costs than they would to uh, take the money from a customer for a cup of coffee. It would be ridiculous. You don't want higher transaction costs than you've got for the product itself. So it's about this time, sort of March, April, that I really discovered Bitcoin private and some of the advantages it's got over Bitcoin. Um, for instance, it's got quicker block times. Instead of 10 minutes, it's two and a half minutes. The network itself is quieter, so the transaction costs are a fraction of a cent. Compared to Bitcoin, which is much more active, they do certainly cost more. But the best part about it is the private part. Um, now, people in their everyday life, they don't want to necessarily show the transactions and things they bought and sold for. We, we're not doing anything wrong, but you wouldn't show everybody your bank statement. And that really is what happens with Bitcoin. It's a public ledger. The information's all out there. Everybody can see what someone's bought and sold. And did you know, for instance, 30% of the Bitcoin transactions can be unraveled. You can find out who bought and sold and to who. You know, there is software out there where you can unravel the transactions. I mean, that doesn't sound good, does it? You, you know, a good portion can be snooped upon. You can find out who's bought and sold. Again, you're not necessarily doing anything wrong, you just don't want to tell the world. So Bitcoin for those that don't, sorry, Bitcoin private, for those that don't know, is using the Bitcoin code base. Um, we have Z Classic, which is the best privacy technology you can pretty much get. It's called ZK Snarks, and it's a method of um, encryption that I will put my hands up. I don't totally understand how it works, but it's absolutely fantastic. The buyer and the seller do not know of each other. There is this air gap between. So it's got amazing technology where you can buy and sell, and transactions happen between buyer and seller, but there is no link. It's impossible to actually unravel who is bought and sold and from who and for what. It was about this time that we started to think, well, this is amazing technology. I prefer this to Bitcoin. What can we do with this to get the baker or indeed other merchants using it? So we started to come up with the idea of a widget that would appear on people's websites. You could click on this, 
and as per some of the previous solutions, it would show the QR code and the address so you could make a payment for something. And this is one of the lovely videos that someone from our community put together. We have a fantastic community of people who get into, involved in the development and the marketing side. So we thought, okay, this is great. Let's try and make a widget we can put into people's websites that will enable them to take Bitcoin private easily. So I came up with this plan. Um, I spoke to a lot of the blockchain developers and they told me this was a bit too complicated. But we started to really think about, well, how could this work? How could we provide an easy to use solution for merchants so they could start selling and take Bitcoin private that will encourage the users to use it and the cycle keeps continuing. I want to produce solutions using my skills to try and help bring this into mainstream adoption. So speaking with some of the blockchain developers and we have fantastically smart blockchain developers that I work with, I learned a whole lot and we came up with a much simpler approach. And the way it works is this. We have a full node server, that's the black thing on the left, and that really runs the blockchain. It looks for transactions coming through. Um, it runs the chain much like the nodes in the decentralized nature of cryptocurrencies. So it's looking for transactions currently, and we built a bit of web tech on this to look for transactions happening and inform something when it does happen. We built a widget too, so with a little bit of JavaScript, um, Anybody could insert this into their website, so the people who aren't aware of technology, it's dead simple. You can copy some code, paste it into your website, and you're able to have a widget. That widget does all the hard work of working out if a transaction has gone through or not. So the customer is able to buy using Bitcoin private using a widget. The merchant's life is nice and easy too because it's easy to integrate, and we've done all the hard work on our node server. However, someone quickly picked up on the point of, okay, this is working. We've got a working proof of concept, um, but it's still our full node server, and it's against the kind of decentralized nature. You know, people will still be coming to us for payments to go through. So, okay, we said, well, our node server could become the merchant's node server. So we wrote some scripts that can be run by their tech team, and they could actually run their own full node server. We're not involved at all. There is no middleman. So you have the customer, and the merchant would control all of this, the node server and the, uh, the website itself. Now, this was still a bit techy for us, having to get them to run a script. So we were working on a one-click solution where people without any technical teams can simply click a button and this deploys automatically. So they are completely in control of their own server and its workings. So this was an early demo, uh, Matt's Pizza Shop. This is me buying a slice of pepperoni pizza. So if you didn't see it before, it showed a widget, which we talked about a moment ago. You click that, and it pops up this display. Um, and this is quite common to a lot of people who have bought with cryptocurrencies. You have the QR code you can scan with your phone. If you're on a computer, you can just simply click pay via the wallet, and that will automatically open up your wallet and start a transaction for you. Um, also, we integrated currency conversion, 32 different currencies that the merchant can say, I want to sell this pizza in euros or yen or sterling or Canadian dollars. They can decide how much it is in a common fiat currency and it will automatically convert it to the amount of Bitcoin for them. And the user in turn can even convert that within their computer uh, setup as well. So we've enabled currency conversion to make people's life even easier again. So we thought, okay, well, how are people going to get this widget and install it into their website? So we built a website called btcppay.com. It's up there nice and big. And we made it as simple as possible so people could go to the website, they could register, they could log in, grab their code in just a couple of minutes, put it into their website, and they're accepting Bitcoin private. So it's a lot simpler than a lot of other payment solutions that might need a lot of integration. Uh, you can just register, log in, grab the code, put it into your website, and you're done.